Hello and welcome to the fifth of eight presentations in the 2021 Great Decisions Lecture Series. My name is Matthew Hughes and I serve as the Executive Director of the International Relations Council in Kansas City, and we're so glad to have you with us today. The International Relations Council strengthens Kansas City's global perspective by maintaining an active dialogue around world events, global issues, and their impact on our community. As a nonpartisan educational nonprofit organization, the IRC values informed civil discourse, accessibility, and substance as we work to sharpen our community's 21st century global acumen. We invite you to learn more about the International Relations Council, including other upcoming events, information on joining a great decisions group, and how to join the IRC as a member on our website at irckc.org. For decades, the annual Great Decisions Briefing Book has framed informed civil discussions about critical international issues. Groups around the country, including here in Kansas City, meet in coffee shops, conference rooms, and now virtually to explore these issues together and distill policy recommendations and future outlooks. To support their exploration and to bring the larger community into the discussion, the International Relations Council is proud to offer a series of conversations with respected experts through 2021 on the year's eight great decisions topics. We warmly welcome diverse perspectives and invite your engagement with these foreign policy issues from work, from home, or wherever you might be. We hope you'll engage that way with us today as we explore the Korean Peninsula. We know that many in the audience have already discussed this topic with their local Great Decisions group, so we certainly welcome your thoughtful questions through the course of the conversation using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And do check out and share other conversations in the Great Decisions lecture series as we consider a range of critical foreign policy issues in the coming months. We're very grateful to our sponsors who have made this evening's program and the Great Decisions lecture series possible. In particular, sustaining series sponsor Cyprian Simkowitz and Jerry White, and supporting series sponsor Nancy C. Messer. Thank you for finding value in these conversations. I'm now pleased to introduce our moderator for today's program, who will introduce our speaker and help us navigate the conversation. Jenny Town is a senior fellow at the Stimson Center and director of Stimson's 38 North program which provides policy and technical analysis on North Korea. Ms. Town is also an expert reviewer for Freedom House's Freedom in the World Index, where she previously worked on the Human Rights in North Korea project. She's an associate fellow at the Foreign Policy Institute at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, a member of the National Committee on North Korea, and an associate member of the Council of Korean Americans. She holds a BA in East Asian Studies and International Relations from Westmar University and a Master of International Affairs from Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs. She was recently named one of Worth Magazine's Groundbreakers 2020, 50 Women Changing the World. Jenny Town, thank you so much for being with us today. Please take it away. Great, thank you so much, Matt. And thanks to IRC for inviting me here tonight to be part of this discussion on the Korean Peninsula. Um, while the pandemic makes gathering together still difficult, one of the good things to come out of it has been this increase in online programming and the ability to reach different audiences around the country in a more efficient manner. Um, I've personally taken part in several discussions over the past year hosted by community-based organizations like IRC and World Affairs Council, and I'm both impressed and encouraged by growing interest in Korea. It's been such a niche issue for so long that it's good to see a growing recognition that what happens on the Korean Peninsula has enormous implications for U.S. national security, global security, and the global non-proliferation regime. It's also a positive sign to see the U.S. ROC Alliance start to advance in new directions beyond just military and security cooperation into more strategic and economic realms as seen at the recent Moon Biden Summit. Uh, we have the privilege tonight in hearing from a distinguished voice in Korean affairs, Dr. Chung Min Lee. Dr. Lee is a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and a specialist in East Asian security, crisis management, and intelligence. 
Prior to joining Carnegie, he taught for 20 years at the Graduate School of International Studies at Yonsei University and was South Korea's ambassador for national security affairs from 2013 to 2016. He's a former dean of GSIS and Underwood International College and has served more than a decade at leading think tanks in the US and Asia, including the Rand Corporation, Sejong Institute in Seoul, and the National Institute for Defense Studies in Tokyo. He's also the author of The Hermit King, Kim Jong-un at the Crossroads of History and Fault Lines in a Rising Asia. And since 1998, he has been an advisor to almost all national security related ministries and agencies uh, in Korea. So it's really an honor to have him with us tonight and learn from his vast experience and insights. So Dr. Lee, with that, it's my pleasure to hand the mic over to you. Well, hi, Jenny. Um, it's a real pleasure to be in front of this audience, although it's virtual. I've never been to Kansas City, but I hope that with this virtual trip, I will be able to make a real trip in the years ahead, uh, in, in, in the months ahead. Uh, let me first thank uh, the IRC, in particular, Matt and Evan and for Jenny for that really gracious introduction. Uh, let me also say that Jenny, as a co-founder of 38 North, has really put North Korean analysis on the top of the uh, global, I, I guess, concern. And it, it is one of the most, if not the most, looked into and sought after and um, cited uh, websites on North Korea. So kudos to you, Jenny, for making all of this possible. So Matt, before I begin, <clears throat> I'll, I'll talk for about 20 minutes and then we'll go into Q&A as well as um, uh, what Jenny's questions or, or comments might, might also have. May I begin by also saying that um, as a Korean who was born in Korea but lived abroad for much of my life, uh, let me thank anyone in the audience who are both listeners or will be able to see this video later on. If you are a member of, um, of the veteran, if you're a veteran who served in Korea, even during the Korean War or after the Korean War, and regardless of you, in the capacity that you served in Korea, let me thank you as a post-war Korean that all the sacrifices that Americans made in Korea uh, back during the war uh, made a huge difference. And as we see the unfolding of the catastrophe in Afghanistan, I'm reminded that the Alliance is only as strong as the people who are who make it possible. And I think in that sense, the IRC of Kansas City brings together Korea and the US in a very unique way. And the Alliance today, I think it's stronger than it's, it's ever been. But I think it's also due to the fact that sacrifices, real ones were made <clears throat> by young men and women you know, in 1950, when I'm sure there were many people from Kansas who fought in the Korean War and they didn't really even know where Korea was on the map, um, but it is due to their sacrifices that all of this is possible. What I want to do today with the audience, since, the, since all of you know so much about world affairs, is focus on a very different take on South Korea. If you imagine South Korea as a Rubik's cube, that's how I always explain it to our foreign guests. So on the one side, you have the prevailing North Korean nuclear issue, Kim Jong-un's regime and so forth. You switch it around, you have a vibrant culture with BTS. And then you have a fast paced economy with Samsung and LG and so forth. You also have polarized politics as we do here in the US. You have a society with traditional social values, highly Confucian. In some ways, there's more orthodox Confucianism in Korea than in China today. But it, it is also one of the highest number, there's a highest number of Christians. Uh, people are startled when I tell them that 40 to 45 percent of Koreans are either Protestants or, or Catholics, and, that, and then the rest of the population are, 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 are Buddhists. So if you look at Korea, in, a, in a one sense, it's a very old traditional country. On the other hand, it's a very young, vibrant uh, uh, economic and political player. So how is this all changing as we, uh, as we see Korea today? And I think we are now at the cusp of some really monumental change, not only within the Korean Peninsula, but all over the world that will have an impact on, on the two Koreas. And there are four major, I think, big <clears throat> waves that are converging today. Now, in Korea, the primacy of geopolitics is real. We are always at the attention or the interests of the world's largest powers, the US, Japan, China, of course, and, and Russia. 
but I think the era of geopolitical domination is nearing its end. I'm not saying it's not uh, unimportant, it is very important, but I think, for example, the era of geotechnology is dawning on us much more rapidly than we think. So it's AI and the fourth industrial revolution, and these changes will have in enormous impact all across the world, but especially in a country like South Korea. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, the second big trend that I see happening is that the overall US power that we've been used to over, over the last you know, 70 odd years is, is ebbing. It is not stopping. America is still the world's only superpower, but, and China, however, is not yet running the world, but we're entering a gray zone where uh, Korea and other American allies really cannot be totally dependent on the US for its own security. And I think as we see developments unravel in Afghanistan, uh, it's going to basically ring alarm bells throughout the region because they'll say, okay, we've depended on the US the last 75 odd years. Uh, will they still be there when we need them? But the key question is this, unless an ally is willing to defend itself, no alliance, regardless of, how, of who is on the other side is going to help it. But I think overall, uh, American power is slowly ebbing. The third key point, and here I think Jenny may, may have a different take. I think as important as the North Korean nuclear threat is, and we focus on that you know, politically and strategically, I think overall, North Korea's value is shrinking. And I say this because, I, because the world is changing so fast. And as the fourth industrial revolution really comes in waves, uh, we will see that North Korea, minus its nuclear weapons and other weapons of mass destruction, really has nothing much to offer to the world. And so its space in the policy world, I believe, is not going to really grow. And that will have uh, implications for both domestic politics in South Korea and the future of US policy towards uh, the DPRK. Fourth and finally, I think this really is an opportune time for Korea to reach out to a new global audience. And I think it's because we're seeing this great marriage between culture and technology. And I believe that Korea has a very unique, maybe a role to play in this because Korean culture is not of course everything about BTS. And as much as I'm a big fan of K-pop and K-drama and so forth, it's just a very small sliver of what Korea can do. But I think with Korea's advanced manufacturing capabilities, whether it's EVs or batteries or cars or ships or whatever, um, it really is a, a critical moment because with advanced technology and a globalized culture, Korea is now able, in my opinion, for the first time to really have a global audience. And that will allow Korea to have some type of a cushion in the midst of these very, very uh, powerful countries. And I think from the perspective of US-Korea relations, as much as we depend on the US for security, for example, I think the Biden Moon Summit in May really showed that the US today needs critical allies that can provide security, political support, as well as technological know-how. And I think that sense, South Korea is a unique player. So going forward, I think it's no longer just a one-way street between Washington and Seoul, but it really, it really is going to be a much more compatible alliance. And so in that sense, I am very optimistic about the future. Going forward, as I said, um, we also face in South Korea tremendous challenges. Let me just give you three. The first is demographic. Uh, I just published a report with some colleagues a couple of months ago. Korea's population today is about 52 million and North Korea is about 23, 24 million, depending on, on the numbers. But in South Korea, we are the world's, I, I think, second fastest Asian society after Japan, and we have the lowest fertility rate in the OECD. So in essence, from about 2030 and 2035, we're going to begin to see sharp drops in Korea's population. So in the last year's census, for example, there was a drop in South Korea's population for the very first time. So you have an aging society, which means you have increased social welfare spending and you have rising social concerns. And then also it could have negative repercussions 
or Korea's competitiveness. So how does this all fit in is something that we have to think about. The second major challenge, regardless of the fact that I think North, North Korea overall is shrinking in terms of political importance, the strategic balance between South and North Korea is entering into a new phase. Because of North Korea's nor, uh, nuclear program that started, you know, as, as you all know, in the 1990s, but since 2006 in earnest, South Korea has begun to build up its conventional military forces, including ballistic missiles. So what we're seeing on the peninsula is like a mini arms race that is not really going to stop. And this is also happening at the same time when the Chinese are really beefing up their security, so are the Japanese and the Russians. So you, you have for the first time a de facto arms race that's happening in Northeast Asia in and around the Korean Peninsula. So regardless of the political atmosphere, the military dimension is going to remain very, very strong in this region for many years to come. The third major challenge I see for South Korea is we need a new political consensus. And since democratization was restored in 1987, we've had a single five-year presidency. Um, we've had various presidents. Unfortunately, as you all know, many end their terms in very unfavorable shapes. And so I think it's time for South Korea to really think about what type of a constitutional process do we want uh, going forward. So if you take all of this together, it's also happening historically, in my view, in the sense that for the last 170 odd years, um, I would argue that the Meiji era of Asia is coming to an end. By that, I mean that since the Meiji Restoration in 1868, when the Japanese modernized first amongst Asian nations, the key word that they used was strong nation uh, and, and rich country and strong army. And that mantra has been basically, you know, uh, followed by almost all of the East Asian countries, including China. But that model is coming to an end, which means what? That all Asian countries, including Korea, must find a new model going forward for sustainable development. And I think in that sense, the Japanese really don't have a model in mind, neither do the Chinese, other than preserving uh, the power of the CCP. So again, in that sense, I think Korea has a, a very niche role to play. Now, what is happening now, especially in the context of the US-China relationship, is that the Americans are asking Koreans and Japanese and Australians and others, including European allies, that in the context of the US-China rivalry, are you with us or are you against us? It's not posed in such stark terms, obviously. And I think as President Biden prepares for the, I guess, summit of democracies, as I understand in December of this year, where, where he will get together all of the world's key democracies, what he will find is that countering China is not really a, a one-stop uh, solution. Every single country in Asia, uh, I think, trades more with uh, China than with the US, including all the American allies. So this means that China today has, a, has an edge and a leverage it never had before. So every time an ally of the US, whether it's Korea, Japan, Australia, for example, takes certain you know, postures, including the Philippines, um, you have to think twice, will there be economic and political blowback as the Chinese have, have shown uh, over and over again? And so as a result for Korea, I would argue, it is not choosing China or America, but it is showing the US that again, South Korea can play a very important and unique role. Let me just give you one illustration. Uh, some years back in Washington, a couple of my American friends who were in government at that time asked me, why is it that the Japanese are much more vocal about uh, you know, uh, uh, the Chinese threat uh, than the South Koreans? So I told my uh, American friend, I said, look, historically, do you know how many times the Chinese uh, have invaded Japan? And they said, no, I don't know. I said, well, zero times. And I said, do you know how many times those who rule China, including dynasties, basically invaded Korea? And they said, I don't know. I said, well, you know, we don't know the exact number, but historians in Korea give the number of about 900 historically. And we've had ties with China for over 2000 years. So I said, when Koreans talk about the China threat, 
it is not something that's intellectual or you see on blogs. This is something that we have experienced over the last 2000 years. At the same time, however, amongst all American allies on the planet, South Korea is the only one that's in Asia's mainland. And so from America's geostrategic interests, I always tell my American interlocutors, doesn't it make sense for America to have a crucial ally who is sitting within mainland Asia that borders China and understands China perhaps better than most Asian countries? And the answer is, is an affirmative. Conversely, I will tell my Chinese friends and Chinese interlocutors, if you continue to look at Asia as you did 300 years ago as the head of the Middle Kingdom, you're not going to, going to get anywhere. And I said, the world is now shifting. We have democracies in Japan and South Korea and even Taiwan. And these democracies, it's about values. And if China doesn't share values that, for example, other Asian democracies share as they don't, there will be definite limitations as to how far China can go with their so-called China first policy. And so in that sense, I believe, again, the choice is not either or, but for South Korea, we have to survive and live with both the US and China, but in terms of our values, our core institutions, uh, our overall framework and worldview, it is unabashedly globalized and pro-Western, but with very deep Asian uh, residues. So that's something that I think Korea will always have. And, and this bifurcated view of, you know, choose me over, over someone else is I think in, in, in many respects, uh, not a really clear argument. So what will Korea do going forward with, with all these geopolitical, economic and political challenges? Uh, some time ago, I was talking to a former student of mine and she told me, you know, she said, Professor Lee, um, if I wrote a book in Korea, she said, I would write it as an accidental globalist. By that, she meant Korea never planned to be a global player, but became one because of its rapid economic progress over the last you know, 20, 40 years. And I, I agree with her. She was, in many respects, an accidental globalist. But going forward, I think South Korea must be someone who is a strategic globalist. By that, I mean, South Korea must be the most globalized of Asian players because that's what gives it leverage. It's not monetary power. It's not a huge GDP. It's not you know, millions of people because all those hard power indicators are still very relevant. But as I said, that will never make Korea a number one country in the region. And so in that sense, I think South Korea can play, as I said, a very important role. Um, what I want to do is conclude by giving you the sense of, you know, Koreans are always very proud of the fact that we have a 5,000 year history. And that 5,000 year history, or at least, at least 3,000 years, is something that Koreans always lived in the sense of being dominated by powers who were much more uh, powerful than they were. So Korea was always the smallest power, always the last guy in the line. But at the same time, today, however, with this new technology of AI and quantum computing and so forth, you don't have to be physically in a place as we are now to be relevant on the global arena. So in that sense, I believe South Korea can play a very important role by a second wave of globalization. But this is only going to become possible if South Korea is able to overcome its sense of so-called, you know, the holy grail of South Koreans, or many of them, is the fact that we must unify with North Korea. But for me personally, unification is a very important national goal, but I don't want to lose any of my freedoms or rights as a South Korean citizen in a unified Korea. So for me, a unified Korea that is free and democratic is absolutely essential. If that happens, I'm all for unification. But even with unification, we're going to face, as I said, a very bumpy road. And fi my final word is, so what makes Korea a de facto G10 country? And this is really surprising because in the year I was born in 1960, South Korea was one of the world's poorest countries. The number of people who went to colleges were very, very small. But over the last two generations, we've made 
you know, unparalleled, unprecedented progress. And I think if I had to explain why this was so, I would say it is perhaps because of Korea's bibimbap culture. And I don't say this in jest. Bibimbap is a Korean dish where you have all sorts of vegetables mixed with rice and a hot sauce and sesame oil. It's because Koreans are good at almost everything in a fairly uh, equal shape, economically, business-wide, diplomacy, military power, cultural assets, technological advance, and so forth. So if you mix all of that together in this big bowl, that's what you have Korea today. And since 87, as I said, we've had many presidents, some successful, some not, and Korean politics in many respects is more rougher, is much more tougher than you have in the US. But over the last, uh, I guess, since 87, we've had so many turnovers that Koreans now are used to political transitions. But from a longer term perspective, for the last 100 or so years, Koreans have gone through a dynastic collapse, Japanese colonization, painful national division, a brutal Korean war, years of military dictatorship, rapid economic growth, rapid globalization, and today, for example, as I said, you know, this new wave of, of technology and culture. So going forward, I'm very hopeful that with, together with our American partners, Korea can play a very key role. And I believe that again, America needs critical allies, not only in Asia, but across the world and, and, and in Europe. And in that sense, South Korea's net value or utility, I believe, is going to go up in the years ahead. So uh, Matt, let me stop there and then I'll ask Jenny to take over. Thank you so much and I'll, I'll await questions. Great, thanks, Chungmin. That was a, a wonderful overview of a, a number of different issues for us to dig into that I'm sure the audience will be um, more than happy to tackle in the Q&A. And please do at any time um, for our viewers, um, uh, pose your questions in the Q&A box and we will get to them in a few minutes. Um, I did want to address the, the one thing you've sort of put out there for me um, in terms of the North Korea issue and where this stands in political importance. And I, I both agree with you and disagree with you. Um, I agree with the idea that it has limited political value going forward. I disagree at the point that it ever had great political power to begin with, political value to begin with. And I think that's been one of the problems is outside of their nuclear pursuits. It is a small, poor country um, that doesn't have a lot to offer, and especially in terms of you know, benefits to the United States. So even if it does get under control, um, even if we do start to go in the right direction, you know, there aren't huge payoffs for that, huge political payoffs for that. Um, I do think it was interesting um, during the Trump administration, um, there was for once um, some high level attention on the issue that was able to address it uh, even when negotiations weren't going well, um, rather than just letting it fall uh, to the side. But I think most of the time there just isn't a lot of political interest or willingness to put political capital into this because there just isn't a lot of political value to, to having success on it. Um, I, I do wonder, um, in your view, obviously, uh, the US had gone through uh, a policy review, a comprehensive policy review, and came out with their new calibrated and practical approach that's open to and will explore diplomacy um, for the you know, collective US and, and allies uh, security interests. Um, and, and of course, during the the summit uh, with Moon and Biden, President Moon did also sign on to this and basically uh, agree that this was the right direction, the right policy, that we were on the same page. Um, in your view, do you think we that Moon and Biden are on the same page? And do you what do you see as sort of the way forward, especially with the limited time that Moon has left? You no, know, Jenny, as you all know, uh, we have crucial elections here in South Korea in March of 2022 to choose the next president. And I think by around September or October, both political parties, the ruling party and the conservative opposition will choose their political uh, presidential nominee. It will be a huge, huge battle for the soul of Korea as it were. And so President Moon only has a few months left in office and those few months 
are going to be dominated by COVID and of course the, the campaign election. So the breathing space, Jenny, for North Korea policy is shrinking even as we speak. Now, there are some media reports, as you all know, that when Beijing hosts the Winter Olympics in January of next year, uh, some people have said there might be a surprise, you know, Moon Kim summit in Beijing. Uh, I don't know whether that's really possible, but at this late stage, I don't think Kim Jong-un is going to make a trip to Beijing to meet with Moon. I mean, what can they really come up with other than some type of other statement that neither of them will be able to, you know, follow through. And I think in terms of uh, North Korea's policy within the Beltway, this is something that you're very familiar with, Jenny. I would argue that President Biden, especially after what we've seen in Afghanistan, is going to have even less of an incentive to really focus on North Korea. There's going to be huge blowback going into the congressional midterms next year. And who knows what type of after effects there will be political and strategic because of the downfall of Kabul. And so I think as much as President Biden really agreed with President Moon on the modalities of engaging and also deterring North Korea, I think his biggest objective was to make sure that Korean companies were able to invest more in the US and that Korea was on board in terms of constraining uh, you know, the rise of China. So again, in that sense, I don't know whether you would agree with me, but I think the space for really opening up North Korean issues within the Biden administration is not all that high. I agree completely. I think after uh, the optics of what's happening in Afghanistan right now, the, there's just no political capital left for yeah. potential failures and yeah. potential embarrassments. And that's uh, yeah. that it been the, uh, the US experience with North yeah. Korea and negotiations with North Korea in the past. You know, Jenny, um, as you well know, as long as China supports North Korea economically, politically, and so forth, there's no reason for President Xi Jinping to lessen his, uh, what is it, assistance to North Korea, because he knows that there really is no alternative. And so from Xi's perspective, controlling the North Korean menace, as it were, is much better than having a North Korea with no backers. And so that's from Xi's perspective, as long as Xi believes that that's his own leverage, there's no real reason for him to cooperate with America on North Korea policy. And of course, the Chinese also really value stability in the region over, mm -hmm. you know, over something that would destabilize. And I think that's right. Yes, U.S. policy towards North Korea as that the U.S. wants to destabilize the situation. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's there's always that clash of values of, of what what they put at the top of the hierarchy. In right, their absolutely. Especially now with U.S. rising, U.S. China competition. Um, you know, as you mentioned, there's uh, been more talk now about um, the strategic relationship, especially the security relationship, extending beyond the Korean Peninsula. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of talk about you know, will South Korea join the Quad Plus discussions? Um, and a lot of talk about, uh, you know, really increasing and enhancing trilateral cooperation with Japan. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, you know, I'd wonder where you think um, South Korea is uh, on, you know, really being able to expand beyond and, as you said, you know, ride this fine line between the U.S. and, and China. Um, how far can they really go and how eager are they really to be part of the Indo-Pacific? Yeah. You know, that's a great question, Jenny, because th that really is a litmus test. How far are Koreans willing to go uh, to, to show their support for the alliance? So um, as, as the audience well knows, you have the Quad, the US, uh, Japan, Australia, and India, who are critical members. You have working groups within the so-called Quad, and Korea is going to join the working groups of, of, of the Quad, but it will not join formally, neither has it been asked, I think, to join the Quad formally as a, as a member. Uh, one interesting thing, uh, Jenny, over the last uh, several weeks, uh, Korean uh, forces have participated in multilateral exercises in the South China Sea. And that really hasn't happened for a long time. But because Korea is so dependent upon trade and the fact that we import every single drop of oil from the Middle East, security of the sea lanes is critical. So you cannot leave maritime security to just Americans or you know, our Japanese or Indian friends. 
Korea has a key stake in making sure you have a free passage uh, from the Gulf all the way to the you know, Indian Ocean and up to the Malacca Straits. But in terms of how far Korea will go politically, I think there are definite limitations. Mm -hmm. And that's because of our proximity to China. And as we saw with the so-called that controversy a couple of years ago, uh, when Korea decided to, uh, with the US, uh, deploy that anti-missile batteries, the Chinese went, you know, ballistic, as it were, because they said these missiles are targeted against, you know, Chinese missiles. And so there was a huge uh, repercussion politically. There was economic and even business blowback. But that made many Koreans believe, Korean company leaders, Jenny, you know what, we are too dependent on the Chinese market. Mm -hmm. Some 23% of Korean exports goes to China which is one of the highest on the planet. So for Korea, reducing Chinese leverage means reducing our dependence on the Chinese market. And so if Korea can shift those markets, Jenny, to Vietnam, Indonesia, other parts of Southeast Asia, or other parts on the planet, that's what Korean businesses have to do. And that's something that I think will go a long way towards you know, uh, lessening anxieties in Korea about China. Uh, but this is something that we have no choice but to live together with the Chinese. You cannot take the Korean Peninsula, Jenny, and stick it to, you know, the middle of the uh, of Hawaii as we want, for example. Uh, and so, if that's the case, we must deal with China as it is. And 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 the as it is suggests to me that our alliance with America is one of the most important leverages we have, uh, you know, going forward. Yeah, I really saw, you know, the the bigger emphasis on the economic and trade during the Moon Biden summit as part of the US trying to help alleviate some of those economic anxieties. Mm -hmm. You know, creating a new market and especially one where there is need, where there is a, a two-way benefit, a mutual benefit in that process. Yeah, so you know, whether it's climate change or energy transitions or EVs, the fact that Samsung and LG and Hyundai Motors and others are investing billions in the US is not only a big plus for American jobs and for President Biden, it also makes Korean companies really stand out on the global planet. You know, in the uh, press summit, press, uh, I guess, uh, uh, statement that they had after the summit, President Biden asked the representatives from SK, Samsung, Hyundai, and, and others to, you know, to stand up. And I think that really showed to me that the U.S. president's recognition of these Korean, uh, you know, conglomerates was really a political boost to what these firms can and should do, um, um, you know, internationally. So in that sense, it is a very different mix of U.S.-Korea relations than we had, for example, you know, even ten years ago. Um, shifting just slightly, uh, you know, I think the Biden administration, when they came in, they obviously had a very big focus on repairing alliances and rebuilding alliances and rebuilding trust in alliances. Um, I think, uh, I wonder, um, there's also been a dual focus, though, on uh, trilateral cooperation, US, Japan, and South Korea. Um, and there's been a real push for, like, really comprehensive trilateral cooperation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you think this is sustainable in the long run or are there limits to how much can be done in the trilateral space? You know, I think the audience uh, who's listening in uh, may or may not know the fact that Korean Japanese ties and Japanese Korean ties have been very brittle over the last you know, several years because of the ongoing controversy over history. And this is deeply driven by domestic politics, both in Japan and in South Korea. And as a result, Jenny, I think the only way that we can make a fresh start that will also impact US, Korea, Japan, trilateral cooperation, which I strongly believe we should, is when we have a new government in office in May of next year. Now, I don't know who will become the next Korean president, uh, but I think there is a good chance that if the conservatives, for example, get back into the Blue House, there will be more support for sustaining trilateral security cooperation. However, if the current progressives uh, somehow win the presidency, there will be less incentive to really go, you know, uh, full uh, full speed uh, on that note. So again, this is driven not by strategic interests, but more for domestic political, I, I, I guess, constraints. And that's something that we will not know until the March 
2022 Korean election? If you had to guess um, as to if there was, say, for instance, a conservative candidate wins the presidential election, mm -hmm. do you have a sense of where they might fall in terms of Korea-Japan relations? I think from all of what we've been able to gather amongst the you know nine or odd other players who have raised their hands and said, I'm interested in becoming the next president. And almost all of them to the T have said that they will support some type of reconciliation between Korea and Japan, and that they want the bilateral relationship not to be always stuck on really deep historical issues. And so I think, as, as I said, all the leading candidates or potential candidates joining in the conservative uh, party have said that they will, if they become president, they will turn a new leaf in Korean Japanese ties. But this also depends on what the Suga government or what the post Suga government in Japan might or might not do vis-a-vis -vis relations with South Korea. But as I said, the conservative candidates now or the potential candidates are much more positive on turning a new leaf on Korean Japanese ties than, for example, the progressive party is, which is the ruling party. Great. Um, I'd like to turn to some questions from the audience. Um, there's a question from Mike Vanderpool um, that asks, uh, what do you think the areas are that the current US foreign policy needs to be improved and strengthened towards South Korea right now? Okay, I think overall, if you look at uh, the relationship, um, it really suffered in some ways during the Trump era. And that's mainly because of what President Trump did. He really wanted the South Koreans to pay up to $5 billion to maintain US forces in South Korea. Uh, the South Koreans pay a little bit over a billion dollars. And that was a major sticking point. And as you all know, um, Trump's uh, three or two and a half summits with Kim Jong-un were parlayed as major achievements by Trump politically, but in terms of what had made progress on substance, there really wasn't much there to be seen, especially on the nuclear front. So Koreans were really dismayed by the political points that President Trump tried to make with his meetings with Trump, but he wasn't really concerned about where the alliance was going. And he had this so-called anti-alliance uh, agenda, not only with Koreans, but with many European allies as well, as you know. So I think what Biden did in the May summit was really change uh, the optics. And I think in that sense, as I said, if you look at the, for any of you who are interested and you have time, if you read the May Biden Moon summit statement, it reads like a statement that a major Western European leader would have made, you know, five years ago. It has everything on human rights, helping Central America uh, with the economic development, climate change, technology cooperation, and of course, denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula. So there really isn't much the US can do to make better the relationship because as I said, it really is on top. The key issue is what will President Biden do vis-a-vis -vis Kim Jong-un? And what will the next South Korean president do vis-a-vis -vis Kim Jong-un? And so I think until May of next year, there was some type of a limbo uh, because both sides are going to wait for a new Korean leader. And at that, at that point, he or she will be able to put their mark on a new Korea policy, which I think will be then coordinated with Washington. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question here from my old friend, Jack Zhang, um, that asks, what is South Korea's stance on China's Belt and Road Initiative? And how do the liberal and conservative parties differ on this question? Well, that's a great question. So the BRI has been going on for several years now. And I think there are a couple of small projects that the BRI has here in South Korea. But for the most part, the South Korean government nor the private sector have really embraced it. And that's because you know much of our infrastructure is being done by Korean technology and Korean companies. So there's no real reason to depend on China for improving Korea's infrastructure, uh, which is good in my view, because it saves us a lot of political capital. But in terms of our support for BRI as an essential component of Korean policy, it really doesn't play much of a, 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 a you know, there really is not much attention on the BRI. 
I think Koreans realize that if the Chinese are really, really gung-ho about BRI, and then it, it goes throughout Asia and, and other regions, it may even have negative repercussions for Korean trade and balance and for Korean companies' competitiveness. So in that sense, we are wary of the BRI taking over Korean businesses. So in that sense, there is a, you know, let's not say much about BRI, but make sure that other projects are there for Korean companies. Is there a real difference in view between the liberals and conservatives when it comes to this issue? Uh, no, not really, Jenny. And so um, why? Because as I said, this really is in, in some respects, it's a very sensitive issue, right? Both political parties will never say anything negative of, about BRI officially, because that's China's business, right? But on the other hand, Jenny, as you all well know, the Americans and maybe some Europeans and maybe other Asian players may want us to be more anti-BRI, but that's not gonna happen. But as I said, from the private sector perspective, there really isn't much of an interest. So in that sense, the political parties simply don't touch BRI. Okay, great. Um, uh, there's a question by Aaron Ray. Um, what is your point of view on South Korean, Japanese, Taiwan relations from a China defense perspective? Okay, that's a very, uh, I guess, complex question, but the Japanese over the last several years have really taken a much more proactive role on so-called supporting Taiwan's defense. And so the key question is, if, God forbid, something terrible happens in Taiwan and they face an existential military threat, will the Japanese help them, the self-defense forces help them through the US-Japan alliance? That's the thinking that as, as far as I can tell. And the Japanese have not gone that far, but I think the Japanese defense minister and other officials have intimated that if there is a major threat to Taiwan, then Japan will take appropriate defensive actions. Uh, well, that's because Japan has, you know, much closer, closer uh, uh, coastal ties with the Taiwanese island than we do, for example. In South Korea's case, our position is very, very clear. Of course, we're concerned about Taiwan, and for the first time between the U.S. president and the South Korean president in the May uh, summit joint statement, reference was made to maintaining stability on the Taiwan Strait. So again, the South Koreans really stuck their neck out because this is a very sensitive issue, as you can imagine, to the Chinese who view anything as intruding on internal affairs. So if there is major military outbreak on the Taiwan Strait, it has a, of course, a huge impact on Korean security. But in terms of any direct support for Taiwan, I think is really out of the question. And we will coordinate together with the Americans, but Koreans in that sense, we're focused much more on making sure that the North Korean threat is contained and what we will do with the rising China. Great, thank you. Um, there is a talk, I believe later this year, early next year, um, the FAD system is going to be integrated into um, the Indo-Pacific Command. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I think uh, back in 2017, when, when President Moon did his apology tour um, in China about the FAD mm -hmm. issue, um, he came back with this pledge of the three no's, mm -hmm. uh, no uh, formal alliance, no more THAAD deployments, and um, no, uh, no- Trilateral security cooperation. Right, right. right. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think the Chinese are going to react to this next phase of the THAAD evolution? Um, and you know, Jenny, this is something that I think the conservatives, for example, they're saying what President Moon did really has really put shackles on Korea, on South Korea, because whatever Koreans do now with our own missile defense, for example, or whatever else, they can say all sorts of things because and say, well, those are the three no's and you are going against the so-called three no's. And so I think the key task for the next Korean uh, leader is to make sure that we will revisit the three no's and see whether there will be a way to make sure that South Korea's security or the security of our American allies are not denigrated or weakened because of the three no's. And that's, that will take a lot of the diplomatic efforts on, on all sides, but those three no's uh, is really a thorn on South Korea's side. And I hope the next president, whoever he will be, will be able to make sure that that doesn't really constrain South Korea's defense choices.
Great. Um, and that kind of brings us back to North Korea also, um, in terms of this recent dispute over the joint military exercises. Mm -hmm. um, what role or what do you think should be South Korea's stance on military exercises, especially vis-a-vis -vis relations with North Korea? I think the most important, I guess, uh, barometer should be, why are you holding these exercises? You're holding them because you want to deter North Korea as much as possible. And as long as North Korea continues with this, you know, ballistic missile development, with this nuclear missiles, the fact that they could even miniaturize nuclear warheads, maybe even put them on submarines, these are all critical threats to South Korea, the U.S. forces in Korea, and to also U.S. forces in Japan, for example, right? So this is something that Koreans must take very, very seriously. We can never play political football with these exercises. And I think in some respects, that's been the case over the last several years. So I hope that going forward, exercises will be held because they serve a strategic value. You don't want to have a huge military exercise because that could be seen as too threatening to by North Korea or even by China. But because of the interoperability of US and Korean forces, Jenny, we are one of the most, I guess, integrated armed forces on the planet with two forces. But if you just do tabletop and computer exercises, these real forces on the ground and the air and the sea will not be able to have combined operations. So in order to, to maintain combined operational capabilities, you must have real exercises, not just you know, uh, tabletop ones. That's why I think even on a, on a reduced scale, it really makes sense to have these uh, you know, command posts and other exercises on a regular basis. And again, this is not, you know, we've invited North Korea to look at these exercises, come and see them for themselves. Uh, and the Chinese are uh, perhaps looking at this as well, but this is not an exercise that, design, that is designed to you know, so-called uh, an invasion uh, scheme towards North Korea, far from it. Great, thank you. Um, we have one question uh, from Marge and Bill, um, and that asks, what is the Korean view of Vietnam as a potential partner in countering China? Well, that's a great question because I think, um, as, as many of our, our viewers may know, during the Vietnam conflict in the 60s and early 70s, South Korea sent the second largest number of troops to fight uh, with the South Vietnamese at that time, allies and Americans. So we sent three uh, infantry divisions to South Vietnam and there were lots of casualties from the South Korean side as well. And so we had that chapter in Korean Vietnamese ties. Over the last, you know, you, then you step forward to 2021, South Korea today is the single largest investor in, South Viet in Vietnam. Korean companies are all over the place. And I think Korea has had one of the most successful relations with Vietnam since it was unified for the North in 1975. Nobody expected this journey, but it has happened. And I think in that sense, Koreans can learn a lot from what the Vietnamese can do, even with a lot less, in pushing back China's you know, more dire postures. Uh, so in that sense, I believe that Vietnam is in many respects a role model or how a small or middle-sized country can take actions to stop China uh, from its shores. And the fact that the Vietnamese who fought a border war with China in 1979, and they won that bloody war, uh, shows that the, the Vietnamese are not afraid of you know, uh, fighting with the Chinese if it comes to pass. But in terms of overall relations, the best way I think can counter China's rise is by having stronger Korean Southeast Asian ties. And that really falls into the, the reason why Korea is so gung-ho about Vietnam and, uh, and, and Indonesia, because those are the two key countries where Korea has rising economic ties. Great, thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Um, I did want to pick up on a thread that you had put out in your opening remarks, and that is on the demographics issue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the security implications of the demographics issue and what South Korea is doing to try and mitigate that, to be proactive yeah. on it. Well, 
today, um, the South Korean Armed Forces is about 575,000 strong. Well, the problem is the number of people who will go into the army, since we still have national conscription for all males 18 and over, is shrinking. So over the next 20 years, the South Korean Armed Forces, Army, Navy, and you know, Marines and Air Force, will have a lower manpower base than they do today. And there's no way you can make that up. So they're talking about reducing the number of uh, months in service down to maybe about you know, a year plus, maybe several months. Uh, they want more civilian support, at least at the uh, you know, master sergeant and below level. They want more transfer to civilian institutions to do so-called defense jobs. And they also want to make it into a more tech savvy uh, army. So where you emphasize AI and drones and robots and next generation fighters, uh, unmanned submarines and the list goes on. But all of this, Jenny, takes, number one, a, a comprehensive national security posture. Number two, you need lots of money. And as I said, the problem is, that, as you correctly pointed out, as social welfare spending increases, you cannot expect the Koreans to pay more money for even defense. So that squeeze has to come someplace. And the only way that can happen is to have a smaller armed forces, but that will be much more tax savvy. But as I said, that will take at least 10, 15 years of, of, of defense reforms. Do you see um, immigration playing any role in making up that difference? Like, do you see any possibility of at some point recruiting immigrants um, into the military? Well, for example, there are over, I believe, nearly 2 million Koreans um, who are offsprings of, um, you know, uh, their mothers or fathers are, in most cases, their mothers are non-Koreans. So these binational Koreans are becoming of age. And so if a male, uh, uh, you know, Korean who happens to have a foreign mother, Jenny, he will go to the army like any other Korean guy. And so it doesn't matter where you were born or what you are doing. If you're 18 years old and eligible for service physically, then you will go to the army. Now. However, how it, uh, but the other side of the, of the immigration story is, will South Korea open up its doors much more openly to immigrants from all over, you know, mostly from, from, from Southeast and South Asia? <clears throat> and that's a very sensitive political question. And in that sense, I don't think Koreans are going to really open their doors for immigration, although that is one way of reducing your, uh, I, guess, uh, I guess, weak points and vulnerabilities because of our shrinking population. And so this debate is ongoing. Uh, it, is, it is more welcoming than before, but certainly not, uh, not as much as we should be in terms of our very bleak demographic futures. Great, thank you. I think we're out of time. So uh, thank you, Dr. Lee, for this great conversation. And I'll hand it back to Matt. Jenny, thank you so much. What a wonderful job moderating and some important perspectives. And Chungman, thank you so much as well for your contributions to this evening's look at the Korean Peninsula. Um, there's so much going on and it sounds like we have a lot to look forward to in terms of world events then with the Beijing Olympics coming up uh, in a few months as well as the Korean election. So we'll be watching both, both of those very closely to see how things unfold. Um, everyone, thank you as well for joining us this evening as we continue the Great Decisions Lecture Series at the International Relations Council. Check out the full series as well as other upcoming programs on our website at irckc.org. Thanks so much, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you very much.